like the other speakers, the violence is not the area I work on, so uh, it's a bit of a stretch. But, um, and I suppose I was put in this session um, today, responsibility and intervention, I suppose because of Yitzhak's idea that perhaps some of my work could be extended to maybe lead to an intervention. Um, I don't know about that, I'll leave that for you to decide. But at least what I'd like to do is uh, bring up a, um, somewhat of a new idea, which is that, well, we're, we've been comparing the extreme violence in Syndrome E and but also the violence of people who are just following orders, a few different examples, um, to enrich things. We should maybe enrich things further by also thinking about extreme nonviolence and what makes someone uh, be a different personality that, that's it. Exhibiting extreme nonviolence, and I guess in all these cases we usually think people aren't, aren't born this way. So there's some learning process that actually makes these things happen, and we should try to understand this learning. Um, and um, so perhaps the perspective from memory research will uh, inform our thinking about how we might learn to be violent, how we might be able to learn to be less violent. And so let's start with some basics of memory research, some principles. One thing is from memory research, we've learned there are many different types of memory. It's not just one type of thing. We often classify memory into explicit or declarative memory in one category, and a whole set of other things called non-declarative memory that includes our skills, habits, conditioning, simple non-associative learning, priming phenomena that are in there. And we understand that there are different brain mechanisms, and memory researchers have spent many decades with special paradigms to try to isolate one type of memory and see what the characteristics of, of it is separately. And so, for example, uh, declarative memory that I spend most of my time with depends on specialized networks in the cerebral cortex. And in fact, it seems to require linking among different uh, storage locations in the cortex to actually make a memory um, stick. And that's something that takes time. It depends on the cortex. The hippocampus is critical for that to happen. Uh, but another principle, though, is that these memories outside of our specialized laboratory circumstances really are interactive, that these, they don't most of the time work separately, but they work together, and that can lead to some interesting phenomena. So looking at that in another way, we can imagine you've acquired some knowledge. You might have some ex explicit knowledge and also some implicit knowledge, and they can both affect your thoughts, your decisions, and your actions. But really, they also work together, and so now we're looking a lot, how do they interact? How do these different types of memory interact to determine our behavior? And then, of course, our thoughts, decisions, and actions go back and with neuroplasticity change our storage. So that's part of the whole message of, of what's happening in memory. Um, okay, so uh, to, to take that a bit further, we also want to think about the three stages of memory. And my talk has uh, cor three corresponding parts. So the first part I'll talk about acquisition with some examples of how learning starts. But then we'll look at the idea that learning doesn't just happen at the immediately, immediate moment of acquisition, but there's steps after that. Learning continues at offline periods, including during sleep. And finally, we'll come back to this idea of interactive memory systems and talk about how declarative memory and non-declarative memory form our knowledge base and guide our actions, and, and both being important types we have to think about. Uh, OK, so let's look at starting a memory. So the moment of memory formation, uh, you can think about meeting a person like at a meeting here and you want to remember them later, you have to pay attention at the moment of, of learning their name or something. And so we've looked at that in, a, in many ways over the years using ERP correlates of memory formation, many different types of stimuli, words, and so on. I'll just give you one example with faces. So imagine looking at these faces one at a time and your task is to remember all the faces. So when you see them again later, you'll recognize the one you've seen before. So as you look at those quickly, you might be able to remember them later. So this particular experiment was done with a grad student leading the project, Heather Lucas. There's her face. Remember that face, too. But now your memory test is to look at these faces and say, well, which are the ones you've seen before? And if you're like most people, you might have more difficulty for the other race compared to your own race. And that's known as the other race effect, very common effect. Part of it, of course, could be that you have more expertise because of all your experience looking at faces from your own race. That's sometimes true. But there's more to it than that. And in Heather's study, uh, we looked at the ERPs during memory encoding, and we showed one effect, which is that 500 to 1,000 milliseconds after the face onset, uh, ERPs predicted which ones would be remembered later. This is a standard subsequent memory effect, uh, so this is the kind of expected effect that, that we saw in this paradigm. 
and is sought to reflect the elaborative coding after you're thinking about the face and anything else you've learned about that person. But we also found something else that was more novel, which was earlier at about 200 milliseconds, there were ERPs that were greater for same race faces and then different race faces, and then also predicted later remembering. And so we interpret this as just the beginning of individuation. So that's the process of looking at that individual and noticing what is peculiar, specific, unique about that one person. And that's done more for same race faces. For other race faces, you're perhaps doing some categorization. You're categorizing their race, say. And you could perhaps do those simultaneously, but they seem to interfere with each other. So the more you spend with group categorization, the less you're actually doing individuation and the less you're going to actually remember having seen that person before. So this is one of the uh, uh, standard ideas about the other race effect, then that we have to remember someone, individuation is the essential process to look at those facial features that will help you identify that person when you see them later. And just naming them as their group is not going to help you remember them later. Uh, but we tend to do that. And so this social categorization can interfere with actually uh, successful memory formation. Now, I was saying before, memory formation doesn't just uh, happen in that one moment. You know, if you meet someone at a meeting and they tell you your name, you better repeat it to yourself later if you really want to commit that to memory. Uh, and so you can think about all we learn every day. Take today, you know, you've learned a lot of things through this meeting. And if I were to ask you now, you could tell me many things. But if I were to ask you a month from now, what happened on that Tuesday? Well, you're going to remember a lot less. So we don't really store in the long term very much of what we might have uh, at the end of each day. So what determines which memories endure? That's a, a persistent question we have to address. And it's certainly more than just what happens at that moment. Um, the key factor is probably rehearsal. So what we're, what we're going to keep is what we rehearse at some future time. And that's clearly the case when you're a student studying material that you want to learn. But the interesting idea is that this rehearsal happens both when we intend to rehearse, when things come in and remind us of something we know, and during sleep when we don't even realize we're doing any of that rehearsal. So that's our newer thinking about memory consolidation. Uh, now again, we think about this consolidation process at a systems level for declarative memory, that remembering a factor or event, it depends on all these fragments in different cortical regions, and we have to link those together. And the cortical storage takes time. It's a bit slower than the fast hippocampal storage that allows us to quickly form those links. And so hippocampal neocortical communication is part of the process where we can eventually get a more stable cortical memory. And now we're thinking uh, speculatively perhaps, well, what we remember every day and what we forget is influenced by, in part, sleep based consolidation that's happening every night while we're sleeping. Many hours, you know, a third of our life every day perhaps. We're spending some time and it's not when the brain is shut down. Uh, the brain is quite busy, and one of the things it's doing is working with the recent memories and integrating those memories with older memories and, and producing later storage. And one of the ways we've been able to study that, which is a second part of the speculation, is that we can actually guide this consolidation process during sleep using sensory stimulation. And that maybe is a mechanism to improve memory storage, but for us, its foremost uh, purpose is to allow us to study this process, to go beyond the correlative evidence and allow us to change what's happening during sleep. Okay, so uh, of course there's a lot of evidence for the implication of uh, sleep and, and memory processing. It's been an old idea, but uh, we have recent evidence. Uh, years ago we, we had the evidence that hippocampal place cells seem to replay patterns during sleep, and so that's an interesting idea that the memories are being brought up again and reactivated, and then perhaps changed. Uh, evidence from correlational results have shown that slow wave sleep is particularly beneficial. So there was a lot of evidence early on in this field on REM sleep and the idea that dreams had something to do with this. But now we're thinking more about slow wave sleep as being a very interesting time when it's conducive to memory processing and memory consolidation is happening then. But in addition to the correlation, like showing that you have better memory after slow wave sleep, we also have been able to provoke memory activation by using learning related sensory input. So you can think of this as a way to hack into the process of memory consolidation during sleep. And I'll talk a bit about some examples of that in a moment. Just also to mention, we, the whole process is, oh, that must be 4 o'clock. The whole process is, is quite interesting at a neural level. It involves some cross-frequency coupling where these slow waves of slow wave sleep are critical because they 
help uh, time lock the thalamocortical spindles, which in turn help with the timing of hippocampal sharp wave ripples. And we can also tinker with these, with these oscillations, and that's some related messages to the hacking into the memory processing. We can also change these oscillations and even make the hippocampal um, processing perhaps better by inducing slow waves. And that's some work uh, in these papers, which I don't have time to go into. Um, not a typo there, interesting, though. It just happens to be that the authors have the same uh, three letters in their name. But let's look at the hacking into memory with consolidation. So remember, sleep every night, we have many sleep cycles, about 90 minutes long, where you go into light sleep and then deep sleep, and then perhaps a REM period that's happening each night. And these slow wave intervals uh, used to be called uh, stage three and stage four. Slow wave sleep has an alternation between the up state and the down state. And the up state is when neurons are very, very active, the down state, not very active. And so the up state is a critical time here because with this high neuronal activity across the cortex, you have the potential for synchrony between different regions, and that's exactly what we need for consolidating these uh, cross-cortical connections that make up a, a declarative memory. Okay, oops. So one of the uh, studies in the modern era that brought this idea, you know, there were earlier studies, but the, the ideas didn't cut, catch on in the sleep research field, partly because of the emphasis on REM sleep and partly because of the idea that all sensory information might be blocked during sleep, which is the old ortho orthodoxy that doesn't seem to hold anymore. Uh, this early study by Bjorn Rash and colleagues in 2007 showed that if you present an odor during learning, a rose odor, in fact, and you also present that odor during periods of slow wave sleep, when the person wakes up in the morning, their spatial memory is improved compared to if they didn't get the odor, if they got the odor only during learning and not during slow wave sleep. So this was a really interesting indication that something interesting is happening during slow wave sleep to improve memory and that that odor cue was the context of learning that allowed people to then reactivate the spatial information that they had learned before sleep and then be able to perform better on the spatial task. So we followed up this study with an auditory version, and we used auditory cues uh, to promote the same kind of memory reactivation and consolidation with the idea that if we could promote reactivation during sleep, we could actually study what's happening in the brain at that moment of memory consolidation that's cued by these uh, sounds that we present. So I'll tell you in detail, one of the first studies we did, John Rood I led, where we had 50 objects, and each object appeared on a screen in a different random location. And whenever it appeared, it came along with an associated sound. They didn't have to learn that connection, so the cat came with a meow, the kettle came with a whistle, and so on for 50 different objects. So after some repeated trials, they were able to learn each location quite accurately, so they knew where each object went, and their test was to uh, use the computer to drag the object to where it belonged, and we could measure how accurately they could do that. Uh, the next thing we did was have the subjects have an afternoon nap in the lab, and when we noticed in the EEG record uh, that they were in slow wave sleep, we presented half of the sounds that they had learned. We picked 25 sounds that were matched in the learning uh, right before sleep between 25 sounds that we did not present. These sounds were each presented once during this uh, nap, so really a very minor reactivation of once for each object, and yet we were fortunate to see some results that uh, showed that those presentations were effective. So again, in the test, after the nap, just like before the nap, each object appears in the center of the screen, and the subject has to move it to where it belongs, where they learned that it, it went, and we measure how accurate they are, and this comparison of how accurate they were after the nap compared to before the nap shows that they often forgot locations, they were a little less accurate, but that forgetting was greater for the uncued objects compared to the 25 cued objects. In fact, for these objects, they pretty much didn't forget. Their, their memory seemed to stay quite kind of stable. So this difference tells us that when we presented those sounds during sleep, something happened to those memories. They were reactivated and strengthened compared to the memories we didn't reactivate. Well, this was an unusual finding uh, that you might not believe if it was just one study. Uh, that's why it was in this journal. <laughs> But fortunately, we've been able to replicate it many times since then. And, and the rep, some of the replications were done by Delphine Odette, who's here in Paris and here with us today. And in, in her study and these other studies, we could verify that this phenomena is reliable, and we're still learning about exactly what uh, features m are required to make it happen. But we seem to have a winning uh, 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 sort of method that can show 
some indication of the memory consolidation and allow us to you know, have a handle on it and continue to study it and see how it works. Now one of the, that's a funny color. Why did it turn white just then? There we go. All right, so one of the things we've done is look at other types of memory. So here's a type of memory that's um, uh, skill learning. So it's a... Anyway, here's the, uh, he's doing it. So as you can see, the person, the subject is using their left hand to play a, a melody on the keyboard. And the melody is played by every time the, one of these red circles goes by that white outline, they have to press the corresponding button, each of these four buttons. And if they press the correct button at exactly the right time, they hear the, the tone and play this repeated sequence of a 12-note melody that's quite pleasant, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, and there's also a blue melody. So they learn two melodies. And the reason we have two melodies is so we can then randomly decide which one do we want them to be better at after they wake up. So again, they take a nap. And here's the performance before the nap. They're performing well on the two, one, two they learned compared to a control melody that they didn't get to practice. And we make the task a bit harder than this by uh, not showing them quite as much of the screen. Okay, so uh, the results of interest are after the nap when we showed that their performance is more accurate for the one melody that we presented during sleep compared to the melody we, they, we didn't present. And of course, uh, we're not asking them to remember the melody. What It's really a more of a visual motor task that they have to do, and they're better at that. The sounds cue them, perhaps, to rehearse that visual motor storage. And as indications of that, we also see that that effect um, correlated with both slow wave power and sleep spindles over contralateral motor cortex. So some ideas of the sleep physiology that's relevant for this uh, memory consolidation. Okay, so let me move now to the one other type of memory that's important, priming. And this is, to just remind you, this is priming for example, in a recognition test, uh, sorry, in a, in a word test, where you see a, a set of words, and in the priming test, each word is shown very, very briefly. So it's an implicit memory test, like tests you've heard around earlier, uh, last couple of days. They just read each word, they try to do the best they can, and the result is they're better able to read the words that were shown earlier compared to words they didn't see. And this priming of face, interestingly, is just quite normal in this group of amnesic patients that I studied uh, in Andrew May's lab in Manchester. Uh, they show a boost in uh, the ability to read the words that had been seen earlier, and yet, if you test their recognition memory, given their amnesic, their memory is quite poor for, the, for those words uh, compared to control. So their recognition is down, their priming is quite normal, so this is one of many findings in the literature showing preserved priming and amnesia. It tells us that this type of memory, being able to be better at something you've seen earlier, doesn't depend on the brain areas damaged in amnesia, such as the hippocampus. So you might wonder, well, what good is this type of memory? Is it just a sort of a remnant of the perceptual system, or does it actually change our behavior? And that's been an ongoing question. Uh, can this implicit memory help us in a recognition test deciding which stimulus we've seen before? And we studied that a bit with some uh, novel findings uh, shown here. Uh, in when people are trying to remember which of two kaleidoscope stimuli they've seen before, they're pretty accurate if they say, well, actually, re I recollect seeing that one before. They're not nearly as accurate if they say no, I, meaning I just think that's familiar, but I don't really remember it specifically. And you would expect they should do worse in the third condition on guesses, and our remarkable findings are is that they're better on guesses, and they're even better on guesses if they didn't pay that much attention when they were learning the stimuli in the first place. And usually with explicit memory, if you want to remember something, pay more attention. Here it's the opposite. The more attention you pay, the worse you do. And we have an explanation for that, which is the two memory systems working together. So what we have to do is pull away your explicit memory, Stop thinking consciously about whether you've seen it before. And if you don't do that, your implicit memory can then guide your performance. And it guides your performance particularly on the guesses. So it's the guesses where they're remarkably accurate. And to confirm that result, there's one finding I'll tell you from 
Mark Desposito's lab in Berkeley where they showed that if you disable dorsolateral prefrontal cortex with the same paradigm, you also get an improvement of memory. And it seems to, again, be restricted to guesses. So if you can take your frontal lobe offline, stop overthinking it, and just respond by pressing whichever stimulus you've seen before, you're likely to be accurate when you, when you're, when you think you're guessing. You don't think you have any information. So it's really implicit information. It's knowledge you don't have. You can think about it as intuitive knowledge in the sense of it's, it's some information that can guide your behavior, but you don't realize you have that information to use and when you use it in this sense. Okay, so uh, accurate guesses are informed by this implicit knowledge. Uh, so then the question is, is implicit knowledge sometimes not useful? And now we come back to the circumstance of of uh, implicit social bias. So we have these biases that are pervasively directed at other groups, the out group, for example. And you can think of an implicit racial bias or an implicit gender bias, and that's what we did our next study on with the sleep consolidation method. First, we had some training to counteract these learned stereotypes, and those have been studied by social psychologists, but they're no to, known to fade very quickly. So you can't remove someone's a racism just with a simple manipulation. It's very temporary. But our question was, well, can this training be used and enhanced if we then reactivate that information during sleep? So let me go through the experiment in, how much time do I have? Where are Five we? minutes. <laughs> okay, good. So this is an experiment led by Xiaoxing Hu uh, to see if learning that reduces implicit bias could be reinforced during sleep. And the method had an IAT that you heard about yesterday morning uh, briefly you get a face and you have to press either the left button or the right, the left if it's a female face, the right if it's a male face, and if it's a word, if it's a science word, the, the left button, if it's an art word, the right button. So you might press the button, we can measure the reaction time and compare that condition to when we change the instructions so that it's female and art on the left, male and science on the right. Now the reaction time might be a little bit slower and that's an indication with the standard IT methods of a bias. So we ran that both for gender bias in this case and a racial bias with uh, uh, African-American faces and, and negative and positive words. So people have the normal bias that everybody has at the group level. Uh, that's to be expected. The next part of our experiment was this counter-bias training. And perhaps it's a little bit like meeting people who exemplify the opposite of the stereotype. So if you have this, the stereotype idea that you know, only men are neurosurgeons and then you meet a bunch of women neurosurgeons who are really great, that might undo your bias a little bit, maybe temporarily. And then you go back and think your normal way of thinking. So, uh, well, this was a more artificial way than actually meeting people, but a standard method where you see a bunch of word pairs, face word pairs, half of them are counter bias, target pairs like the uh, female face and science words, and you have to press a button each time you see one of those pairs and not on the other types of pairs. And when you do, you get a sound uh, like that. And that sound is now linked with learning that counter bias training for gender. And then you'll do another uh, task. These take about 15 minutes each. So you spend 15 minutes on counter training the racial bias where your target is African American faces with positive words. You hear a different sound, might be that one. And so both of these training uh, situations happen real quickly, and um, we counterbalance which sounds we use, but the result then from the IIT is that, as expected, the training reduces the social bias in each case as measured with the IIT. Okay, so that all happens before sleep, and now we have two sounds we can make a use of in the way we did in our prior experiments. So we pick one of those sounds to present during sleep and remind people of their training, either on the uh, anti-racism or the anti uh, sexism type of training. And again, it's a 90 minute nap. We monitor for slow wave sleep and then we reactivate one type of training. The results when they wake up, they take the IIT again. We now measure it and now instead of looking at the two biases, uh, gender and race, we're looking at the, whichever one was cued during sleep and whichever one wasn't cued during sleep, half and half are done. And those uh, actually differ a little bit here. They didn't differ in one of the subsamples, so we don't think that's an important difference. The important effect is the other one where the post-nap result shows that there's even a greater reduction in the cued bias and there's no change or even a little bit of an increase back to normal levels for the uncued bias. So it seems that we did reactivate those memories for training while people were asleep and there was an effect of that which enhanced the training. So even though these effects are temporary, they can be enhanced, and that's a 
probably a normal part of consolidation. And in this case, we tested a week later and could still see some remnant of that cued social bias being reduced more. So perhaps it can last a lot longer. Of course, you could do more than 15 minutes of training to make the effect last longer. But it's interesting that it's sleep dependent in the same sense. And an interesting other study showed that if you train people to reduce their other race effect with what's called individuation, individuation training, you can also reduce this implicit social bias. That sort of brings the two parts together. So to go over the talk, um, in the first part I showed the social categorization interfering with individuation, and there's an antidote for that, which is to treat each person as an individual and look more about what makes them different uh, and unique rather than just focusing on their category. Then we looked at learning that continues offline, and I gave you the idea that, well, there's more storage changes, more changes in memory storage that happen, not just when you're learning and awake, but also in subsequent periods of sleep. And we think that's a pervasive phenomenon. It's not limited to declarative memory. It includes other types of memory as well. And, but there are important differences between types of memory, of course, that we aren't getting into. And then, now we use declarative memory to guide our actions often, while at the same time, non-declarative memory influences what we know and how we act, in the case of intuition, also in the case of implicit social bias. And so the antidote for the implicit social bias is to examine our conscious social attitudes and see, well, where did they come from and how might they be influenced by our implicit social biases? Because those are intertwined in complex ways. And when we're making important decisions, maybe hiring decisions, we might want to take that into account. We can use strategies to try to reduce the influence of a bias. For example, in an orchestra, when they're interviewing a, a new violin player, they might do that behind a screen so they don't know who it is. Well, we can't always use that method, but we can take steps like that. And we can also train to reduce the bias itself. So not letting the bias have too much of an influence and training to reduce it. Okay, um, and you might ask dehumanizing. Is that a similar type of training where we actually reduce uh, our, you know, change our feelings about a, a category of people and dehumanize them. It might work by the same mechanism. So finally, if you're learning to be uh, a particular type of person, what you become, which is what you know and what you do, well, that's a function of learning, and learning is influenced by sleep. Uh, we don't think people are born evil, but you could ask, well, what makes a person become a suicide bomber? We've been asking that. But we haven't asked this other question, which is, well, what makes someone commit self-immobilization? -immobil uh, and that's a, another violent phenomenon. Uh, it's not to be condoned either. It might also be an expression of some oppression that people might be feeling. But it's different, and we should think about the ways that it's different. I think one of the ways it's different is if you can think about, you know, Tibetan monks that have uh, taken this action, and there are over 100 that have done that in Tibet. Uh, they also have a strong, you know, profound sense of not harming other people. So this is a, a violent demonstration, but it has this idea of not harming others that's really quite the opposite of uh, a suicide bomber. So we should think about this, the opposite kind of thing, and, and you know, people that go out and spend their time and effort trying to uh, increase human rights, and, and as in this group in Chicago, trying to have some effect on society that's not really selfish, but s is trying to help other people. What's that about? What makes a person cherish nonviolence, be eager to help others, be dedicated to human rights causes, be generous to others, and so forth. All the things people do, well, that's altruism. And part of that happens if you have less selfishness. So less egotism, tribalism, less nationalism, these all might contribute to more altruism and the opposite of, of a suicide bombing. Um, and again, like memory in general, this is about practice, so it's not about just flipping a switch and saying, okay, now you're compassionate. That doesn't really work that way. It needs to be practiced. So it's pra compassion is a skill that you can attain and you, you can get better at it. And for example, if uh, a musician or an athlete achieves a very high level, that doesn't mean, okay, now they don't need to practice anymore. The, the musician is practicing many hours every day still to keep that up. And so at a broader level, we can think about well, what kind of society is conducive to individuals like that with these nonviolent orientations, a sense of inclusiveness for everybody, the cultivation of compassion? That's a good metaphor, but really, of course, it's not just starting being compassionate, but continuing to practice uh, that's important for this type of memory as in other types of memory. So let me finally uh, thank my uh, collaborators I've been fortunate to work with and my funding agencies, and thank you for your attention.